there's actually a, a seeming contradiction between what I spoke about in the opening lecture uh, on, on the ring and my account of Das Rheingold. Um, I argued uh, in my opening lecture that Wagner's ideal of theatre was the creation of a seamless work that has an almost mesmeric effect upon the audience. And we can, in fact, define this work, and this is the term that's been used to define it as the Gesamtkunstwerk, or the total work of art. That work in which everything is so unified that you're not really aware of the difference between the different artistic elements. Or at least that is the theory of the Gesamtkunstwerk. Um, and yet, Das Rheingold, uh, and, and certainly in the way that I have described it, um, as, is not exactly a work that typifies this idea of theatre, because rather than sort of draw you in mesmerically, actually Das Rheingold is one of those works that sort of, sort of you know, jolts the audience around. You know, we move us from sort of moments where we, we are quite moved or quite frightened into moments where we are sort of suddenly we laugh or we suddenly find ourselves in a very, very ironical mo mode. So in many ways, Das Rheingold is actually quite disruptive of the idea of the mesmeric theatre of the Gesamtkunstwerk. In fact, in many ways, the ring itself is not that good an example of the Gesamtkunstwerk. There are certainly passages of Die Valkyrie where we do feel ourselves sort of drawn into the work so that we, sort of, we almost feel ourselves to be part of it. Uh, but, and, and there are modes to in Siegfried and Goethe Dameron, uh, but on the whole, the ring does not tend to be that much of a sort of a work where seamlessness seems to be of the essence. Actually, the two great Gesamtkunstwerks in Wagner's output, um, at least according to the definition that I've given, are, of course, Tristan of Isolde and Parsifal. Those are those two works that really in, in require our total emotional and sen sensual and sensuous commitment to fully understand what is happening. But the ring, right way through to a certain extent, sort of tends to sort of push us away, which is one of the reasons why, when you see some of the pictures I'm bringing up, it's been actually quite suitable for Brechtian treatment. You know, it's actually res responded very well to uh, modern theatrical techniques. Um, but anyway, there is no doubt that the uh, Bayreuth Festspiel House was built specifically to house the ring, even though I think it suits Tristan and Parsifal best. Uh, but, and as I talked quite a bit about the, sort of the, the beginnings of the Bayreuth Festival, I thought I'd just at least sort of finish that narrative now. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about the Bayreuth Festival before we move on to issues of staging the, uh, the Das Rheingold. Uh, first, the placement. Why did Wagner decide to go to Bayreuth for his, uh, his, uh, his theatre? Well, first it was because he heard that there was a great and wonderful theatre in Bayreuth, and this was the Margrethe's Open House, or the Margrethe's Opera House, which is actually one of the great um, masterpieces of Baroque theatre architecture. It, uh, um, Germany has many, speed, many examples of this type of theatre. The Margrethe's theatre is among the best. And Wagner came along to see, see it, and he was really very impressed by it. He went inside and saw this, and was also extremely impressed, and then he saw this. This is the stage from one of the boxes, and said, yes, what a magnificent building this is, but then quite rightly said, it's not for me. He couldn't put the ring on in there. And in fact, that was a pretty sort of instant decision. He sort of, he, he, he enjoyed it because it, as those of us who have been to Bayreuth and been to the Opera House, I'm sure do, but at the same time, he realized that it was not a place where the ring could be put on. Um, however, he was very much attracted by Bayreuth itself. Here we have Bayreuth as it is today, uh, which actually I think gives a good idea of the sort of the sort of the, the small town semi pastoral atmosphere of, of, of the place. Um, he felt that this was an ideal place for his work to be performed. Here we have a small town that is really quite a long way from the large cities, the largest the largest cities close to Bayreuth, I suppose, Nuremberg one side and Dresden and Leipzig on the other. Um, but he felt that people could come to Bayreuth as to a pilgrimage, so they would come here and they would focus solely on his works. Um, the rural nature of the place attracted him. And I don't know, I, I always find the 
interesting thing about Bayreuth is however you approach Bayreuth, whether it's by car or by train, you always get the impression that you go through hills and you come into a protected place. Bayreuth has that idea that it's sort of protected from the rest of the world by sort of some relatively low hills. Um, it is actually a, a, a very a, attractive city, I must confess. I'm not quite so sure I want to spend my complete life there. As, well, you know, I'm outside the sort of the August is probably not exactly sort of zipping of life all the time, though it does now, of course, have one of the most important technical universities in Germany. Um, but the municipality of Bayreuth, hearing that Bach Wagner was interested in building a theatre, um, were in fact sort of um, uh, felt that it would be a great idea to attract him there. So they became deeply committed and they gave him a, 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 a place on a hill above town. Uh, well, the moment you get out of the railway station, you can see it up there among the trees. Um, uh, the placement and the configuration of the theatre were very much part of Wagner's idea of the Gesamtkunst there, of the total experience of going to the theatre. Uh, initially, this was a fairly awkward looking building. Actually, this is still what the, the Festspielhaus looks pretty much like today, except today, on the whole, uh, one, the, 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 uh, the, this, the, the facings are much neater than they are here. But the interesting thing here is, is actually, it's reminiscent of an Elizabethan theatre. And to a certain extent, this was actually deliberate. He wanted to give someone, he very much admired the Elizabethan theatre, even though he never used its stage techniques. Um, but. Um, uh, this was the theatre as it was opened in 1876 on top of a hill above the town looking down. So you have to sort of go up to the, to the, to the, to the, the theatre as almost to going to a church where you are going to worship the work of art. Here we have the audience on the first performances of the Festspielhaus, and we can see here, I showed you before, uh, the, just the, 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 the bare sort of um, auditorium. Here we have everybody in their mass ranks, uh, and um, uh, it, we can see here the similarity with the Greek Roman theatre. It is a very democratic auditorium. This is very important. He didn't want any of those boxes. For a start, they indicated class. Secondly, if people went into a box, they didn't pay attention to what was going on on stage. They paid attention to each other, to their cards, to their wine, and to their gambling. So he really wanted a theatre where everybody looked. And this is one of the most remarkable things. Any of you by will know, when you sit down there, there's nowhere to look but the stage. This is quite an interesting uh, picture. This is actually from, by, uh, from uh, the Festival House during the Wieland Wagner times. But I, I like this picture because it gives you a, a really vivid idea of the, uh, the, 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 um, uh, the, the wedgeness of this theatre. Everybody has one mass. So in another, another important thing is everybody felt part of one. They, felt they, could, they could potentially feel as if they were part of a folk. So there really is that sort of sense of the, the ideals of those theoretical works actually moving into the theatre itself. And of course, one of the most famous features of this theatre is the sunken orchestra pit. Here we have a picture of this orchestra pit from uh, about close to the time when the theatre was initially built. Um, we have the open space here, and then there are sort of the, the, the orchestral um, uh, players are um, put down somewhere very right deep in the pit. I believe it's the tubers and the trombones, the loudest brass instruments that are down there at the bottom. Here we have uh, the pit as it is um, in the, as it is today. And we can see it's quite a large and capacious space. But the important thing is, is the sound sort of emerges from the pit. Whereas in the average opera house, you can see the orchestra and you can see it playing. Um, and actually, I think that's an advantage. I love seeing orchestra and opera houses, but Wagner didn't want that. <coughs> Wagner actually really wanted to sort of have the, or the, or the orchestra hidden. Again, as part of that whole idea of everything becoming seamlessly a whole. Furthermore, he did have the very good sense, realizing that his music was often very loud, the orchestra was very loud, and so by putting it in the orchestra pit, uh, to a certain extent, it was muted so the singers could be heard more clearly. But the wonderful thing, of course, about the sound in Bayreuth is when you hear it, you don't know where it's coming from. Oh. When the orchestra first plays, you don't know where it's coming from. It's sort of like suddenly the air is full of sound. And that again is a Gesamtkunstwerk experience. That sort of suddenly the whole area that we're in is, 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 is just sound. Um, and another very, very interesting thing, by the way, about Bayreuth is smaller voices can be heard in Bayreuth than they can in bigger opera houses. 
So sometimes you will actually hear people have got small voices that are quite subtle, quite expressive, that might be lost in the Met or, 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 or at Covent Garden or La Scala or something like that, can actually be heard often quite clearly um, at Bayreuth. They actually sort of pierce the orchestra uh, very effectively. The other interesting thing is, and this is one of my really favorite parts of the theater, is the auditorium. Um, Wagner had a problem because he, no boxes, no boxes. Actually, there are boxes there. We'll talk about those in a moment. But there, there's no boxes on the side. And so he just had blank walls. And those blank walls actually look, were, were pretty unattractive. So actually what he did was, he actually built a double proscenium arch. So we have the proscenium arch here and here. And, and the double proscenium arch was essentially to sort of focus attention on what was going on on the stage. But then these uh, sort of uh, these these um, uh, sort of elongated pillars here, all are essentially a continuation of the proscenium arch. So when you sit in the middle, and this is actually a very palpable experience, you actually feel that you are sitting in the same space as the stage is. You don't get this in the average proscenium uh, uh, theatre. The average proscenium theatre audience here. Uh, stage here, and we look in on the stage. But in Bayreuth, you get that sense that actually you're physically part of what is going on. And again, that is very much in, uh, in, 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 in the spirit of the Gesamt Kunstwerk. Um, I actually, um, the, the, it, it's all faced in wood, because wood is good for acoustics. I actually did have the experience a few years ago, uh, I, I, I heard Tristan Nazola, uh, there are boxes at the back here. And I heard Tristan and Azora at the back, it was the last performance of the Heine Muller production. Uh, and, and I can remember sitting in the box after I had actually been sitting before in the actual body of the theatre, and in the box the experience is entirely different. You sit in the box and you actually you feel you're looking down on the audience, that the audience is part of the whole, but when you're in the box, you are not part of the whole. Um, which is why when I go to Bayreuth next time, I'm going to refuse a box seat because the experience really is wonderful uh, uh, here. And another thing you find <coughs> acoustically that's pretty even, actually, uh, I noticed I sat at one point where I got a little bit of a wobble here and there, um, uh, but, uh, but sight lines are also very good. So acoustically and sight lines, on the whole, this is, this is pretty good. This is as close, perhaps, it gets to a perfect opera house. And this was, um, it was based upon a model of a theatre that was initially going to be built in, 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 in Munich, uh, and, and, um, and Wagner borrowed the design. Now, too, what went out on on that stage? Now, the, it's important to remember uh, that Wagner was very deeply dissatisfied with the first production of The Ring. He really felt that in terms of staging, in the terms of the way in which it had been put on, that it really did not fulfill the imagination that he had poured into the work. And he claimed uh, in, in a letter after um, it had been done, he said, if I am to do this again, everything will be done differently. And he was referring primarily to the staging, the actual design and the blocking. Um, there's also evidence uh, from letters and also from Cosima's diaries and from other, uh, uh, other incidental documentation that he and Cosima were actually quite dissatisfied with the sets and with the costumes, particularly the costumes. And they said, the problem is, is that all these costumes are intended to do is to describe what, uh, to, to describe what the person is that, or that person's place within a larger context. It, they do not describe the symbolic meaning of the, of, of the characters. They don't actually describe the inner world of the characters. So they already felt that the, the general style of romantic realism, which is the way most opera, in fact all opera, uh, Italian, French, German, all operas performed in the 19th century, they did feel and sense that this was inadequate to what Wagner actually wanted. Though one of the problems with Wagner, and indeed with Cosmer, is Actually, visually, they were not, uh, certainly Wagner visually was not nearly as inventive. And he was not, not nearly as much a visual genius as he was a musical or a poetic genius. Um, but they didn't like the literal aspects of the productions. They wanted something more symbolic. Um, so when sort of people occasionally sort of plead for, please could we keep to the same stage style, that was used when these operas were first performed, 
Um, I think we have to realize that Wagner himself was not actually interested in that stage style. In some ways, he really felt it was inadequate to represent the action that he had created. Um, and certainly, uh, the, 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 um, figure, the, the pictures that have come down to us in the first production of Das Rheingold from Bayreuth um, do give the impression of a very heavy, a very literal production. Um, here we have the opening scene of Das Rheingold in 1876. Uh, Wagner actually was the stage director, director, and the designers were Joseph Hoffman and Max Bruckner. There's a very complex issue about sort of uh, how the responsibility for the design changed from one designer to another. But we can see here actually a, a very good example of romantic realism, and um, the, uh, the, I'm quite sure it didn't look exactly like this. This is an idealized version of it. Um, we, we do know that the, uh, uh, the Rhine daughters were sort of propelled around on rather precarious sort of um, uh, trolleys with long sticks on them. Um, uh, uh, but um, Wagner, uh, uh, sort of, I mean, in terms of the stage um, technology at the time, it was probably fairly, uh, fairly, uh, um, fairly advanced. Uh, but Wagner himself uh, was not really that, sad, that happy. Here we have uh, another moment, this is uh, later on, this is where Loga captures Alberic. And so we can see here, this the design here, sort of um, uh, quite familiar, sort of rather exotic uh, romantic realism with more than a touch of a gothic <coughs> about it. Uh, so this is a fairly, as I say, a very conventional design for opera at that time. As I say, Wagner was a genius in many ways, but he had a very limited, and I think a very conventional understanding of the world, visually. But he did have a conceptual idea of how things might change. And there's one little document that virtually nobody ever pays attention to, which is his report on the production of Parsifal that he did in 1883, 82. And he said, I have discovered in directing the singers that it is much better for them to half indicate an idea than to completely indicate an idea. In other words, if somebody gives a complete gesture with a corresponding sound, this tends to be too much. It tends to overwhelm. It tends to be too literal. It tends to be double. Whereas if you give a great announcement with just a suggestion, there's a tension within it and something that draws the audience's imagination. And I would say that actually Wagner here did happen upon what was the great discovery of the founder of modern stage design, and indeed some people will say of modern stage direction uh, as well, uh, this gentleman here, Adolf Appiah. Because it was Appiah who was the first to try to solve the problem of how we make the audience imagine the music while looking at the stage. You see, one of the problems with realism, whether it be the realism of 1876 or the realism of Copenhagen in 2006, the problem is it tends to be very literal. And it can become so literal that you say, I don't need to have the same thing said twice. It's said once in the music, twice in the words, actually three times. Once in the music, twice in the words, and, and, and three times in the gesture. And that therefore, um, to really move the audience and to draw them into the performance, less is more. And, that, that, and I'm not just saying that as a cliche. Less really can be more in the theatre. Because in the theatre what you have to do is you can't blast everybody with, um, with exciting sound and noise and everything. You have to invite them in. Once you've invited them in and got them there, you can blast them with anything you like. But what you need to do is you need to get them there in the first place. Um, but it was happier, was the, the visionary who, who really actually insisted that the way in which Wagner's operas were directed and designed, in fact, went against the spirit of the action. He said, in particular, um, what Wagner is interested in is not the literal representation of the action. What he is interested in is the inner world of the characters and the symbolic world which they actually represent. And therefore, how is it that we represent this on the stage? And Appiah went into a, 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 introduced a number of reforms that, by the way, were important not only in the production of Wagnerian music drama, but in, 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 in opera and in theatre as a whole. But, but Wagner was the figure who inspired him. He wrote his books about Wagner. 
Um, it, was, it, was, it was going to Bayreuth and seeing what he considered the truly dreadful productions of, uh, of, 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 the, of the realistic productions of the 1880s. Uh, in the 1890s. It was this that really led him to try to find a way to make Wagner more sort of um, uh, appealing on stage. And so his main, main reforms were first, he wanted to strip the stage of all but the essential objects. We don't need to cut to the stage with swords and dragons and, and mountaintops and trees and everything like this. We just need the uh, objects that are absolutely essential for the understanding of the drama and the pursuit of the drama. Uh, secondly, he insisted on three-dimensional scenery. And until this time, the 1876 production was basically paint painted on flats, two dimensions. It was Appiah who introduced the whole idea of three-dimensional scenery, and he said it should be non-representative. It should not try to literally reflect the appearance of everyday life. Rather, it should be abstract, geometrical, so that the body of the actor stands out. Um, because we, the actor should be allowed to uh, be seen clearly. It's very interesting, actually. I was just looking at the cover on, the, on Jim Holman's book of, um, uh, of, of, of um, I think it's, no, no, it's the other one, of the, the, yeah. the ring. Yeah. It's, it's actually of... Um, Quartz. Yeah, it's of the, 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 um, the, the, uh, the, the handle to the ring. And actually, if you look at that, uh, in, the, uh, in the right corner, you have Votan, and you can't see him. You can't see him, because he's against a rock. And in fact, one of the things that Appiah pointed out is you can never see characters on the realistic stage because they're always sort of blocked or, 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 sort of, or hidden by the background that they're standing against. So he argued for sets where you could see the body very, very clearly. Most important, certainly for me, I think it's the most important, that the stage should be a space where the audience could use its imagination. We hear the music, we look onto the stage, and that stage should not be telling us what we have to think. It should actually be a stage which we can imagine, a space we can imagine we can occupy and begin to interpret the world word for ourselves. Uh, and this is where the whole realistic tradition and uh, many modern directors uh, are not influenced by Appiah or go against Appiah's ideas um, that what we saw last night was clearly, very clearly telling us, you, you're supposed to think in this way. But Appiah was the one who introduced this sort of uh, the, an alternative uh, approach. And uh, uh, finally, light as the paint of the stage. This is a wonderful thing. Of course, he came in just as electric light was coming, was coming in, and, let, and light was no longer just used as a general washing stage. It was possible to focus light. It was possible to vary intensities of light in different parts of the stage. You could bring in color. It didn't just have to be a sort of a, you know, a sort of a general whitish wash. And so he really sort of, uh, Nowadays, this is all just absolutely obvious to us, but it certainly wasn't in the 1890s. Now, he was actually not a, a very practical man. It was his, his vision that really sort of served as an inspiration for a large number of people. He mainly actually uh, worked out his ideas in terms of books and in pictures. Just to give, um, just very quickly, one of his most famous, the Valkyrie Rock. Here is a perfect happier. All that matters basically here is this these Valkyries here, and look how they stand out against this background. There is this strange tree here, which is included there, I think, because Grana is supposed to be put under a tree. Uh, in, in, in later versions, of, he, he went, went through different versions of the Valkyrie Rock, in later versions that tree actually disappeared. But we can see here, really, the beginning of modern minimalism. And when we look at that, and, um, and we, we have seen that, that, that set almost recreated in productions that we have seen on the stage today, but it's radically different from the, 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 the realistic one that was seen on Bayreuth in 1876. Here we have two uh, settings for Das Rheingold. He did actually uh, direct Das Rheingold in Basel in uh, 1924, I think it was, no, 26, uh, and um, it wasn't at all successful because it's done a very cubistic style and people found it very difficult to understand. But here we see in this basic set that does Rheingold, clearly the basic idea for many productions that we have seen uh, in, 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 in subsequent years. And here we have another uh, picture, I'm afraid I can only find this uh, as the cover of a book. This is actually the Rheingold itself. This is the opening scene of the Rheingold and the, 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 the Rheingold's around here. Uh, and, and the Rheingold is just sort of, you know, sort of vaguely indicated. It's not something that is clearly defined as sort of um, as, 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 as gold or something. 
But uh, anyway, he did direct us Ryan Gould in Basel toward the end of his life, and it was a disaster. But one of the things about Appiah was he was a very, very shy and a very withdrawn man and had extreme difficulty getting on with people. Um, Cosima Fardner firmly rejected Papia's ideas. She said, no, the master did not want it this way, therefore we will have none of them. And um, she was probably wrong here, because there is evidence that Wagner was beginning to think in what I think we can now call Papia-esque dimensions um, toward the end of his life. That, that Wagner was beginning to learn the values of minimalism, of understatement. Um, that's particularly when he encourages actors to do half gestures rather than full ones. Who knows what Wagner might have achieved had he lived for another 10 years. Um, Cosima's productions in Bayreuth uh, remained uh, literalistic, romantic realistic, though I should point out, even in the last 10 years of her life, from 1920 to 1930, if we look at the pictures of productions on the Bayreuth stage, the ideas of Appiah were beginning to creep in because we do find an increasing abstraction in the Bayreuth, uh, the Bayreuth productions. But, 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 but Appiah's fullest impact was not felt until after the Second World War, when his design approach was adopted for two reasons by Wieland Wagner when the Bayreuth Festival opened. First, they had no money, so they really couldn't have these, these gigantic realistic sets. And secondly, Appiah was non-political. And it was very important in the 1950s that we had a, a non or an unpoliticized Wagner. And so it is um, Wilhelm Wagner um, who, is, uh, who in many ways really brought Appiah's ideas onto the stage. Uh, maybe I'm going to give a very generalized statement here now, which actually holds up on the whole. Uh, and that is that the 1950s and the 1960s were characterized primarily by the appiaization of the Wagnerian set. I can remember when I first saw The Ring in Covent Garden in 1964, that The Ring I saw, um, first of all, was conducted by Georg Scholte with Hans Hotter, Birgit Nilsson, Gottlob, Bob and Gaston, so beat that one. As a matter of fact, uh, I'll, I'll tell you more. They, uh, they, 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 they gave a concert at the proms of the um, the the, um, um, the the Liebestor, the, the prelude and Liebestor from Tristan and Zola in the first half, and then Act Three of Goethe Devering in the second half. And I actually managed to get into the front row standing, so that Shorty was about that, literally right, very close, and Birgit spat on me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know what I'm serious about? I, as I say, I didn't wash for a year. <laughs> um, oh, actually, I'll tell you, the, 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 the experience of actually having Big Nielsen right there and Gottlob Frick. Gottlob Frick, I've never heard of him before. Uh, uh, this concert was actually before they gave the run of Cop and Garden. And, and I can remember he stood up. I said, God, he's a tiny little man. You know, he was, he was really quite small. I thought, oh. I felt rather disappointed. You know, I thought his heart was a really big fella. And then he opened his voice, and the whole Albert Hall shook with that voice. It was an amazing experience. Anyway, um, I'm not there to talk about that. I'm here to talk about scenic design. Um, but anyway, the, 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 that particular production that I saw at Covent Garden was actually directed by Hans Hotter, but it was done in uh, sort of what now had become sort of, you know, sort of card carrying Wieland Wagner, Appiah esque style. And I think you saw that right away through Europe in the 1960s. Uh, and, and indeed into the 1970s. In fact, I can remember seeing a Rheingold in Duisburg sometime in the 1990s in a VLAN style, and actually that was a little, little bit old by then. But anyway, it was in the 1970s that things began to change. And the second big influence, I think, is Bertolt Brecht, and they're trying to introduce social realism onto the stage. So on the whole, there tended to be a sort of a counter movement. And interestingly enough, actually, the first person to do it was Wilhelm Wagner, because not only did he do um, these abstract designs, toward the end of his life, he started doing De Meistersinger in a very, very sort of a sort of Brechtian social realist style with sort of you know, very sort of clearly defined sets and very, very rough and harsh sort of environment, very realistic environment. But it was in the 70s that this really got going. And this is when we find the first wave of productions of the ring that really focus upon 
the political and the social and the economic themes in contrast to the metaphysical themes which were, what were focused upon more in the 50s and the 60s. And of course the moment when the world became fully aware of this was what I call industrial realism, I think it's rather a good term actually, um, uh, is Patrice Charot, his production of Bayreuth in, in 1976. I, I haven't, haven't, didn't see this, uh, I, I have seen it um, as I'm sure all of us have done on, uh, on, on, on video and, and now on DVD. Uh, but uh, the Charot ring sort of, uh, was set basically in the 19th century, 19th century industrialization, uh, except the gods were 18th century aristocrats. And when you think of the history of Germany for a moment, that makes a tremendous amount of sense because the, so it was, there was still 18th century political structures that were very much in, uh, um, uh, in, 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 sort of in, in power still in the 19th century. And it was those political structures that Wagner himself was questioning. So anyway, uh, the, the Charot uh, ring was the, the, was the first um, a Wagner uh, sort of industrial realistic production that, that really hit the international headlines. And it is said, by the way, that when it was put on television, and seen on television, it was instantly seen by more people than had ever seen Wagner in the art house before. Because, of course, modern media do spread these things much more broadly. Uh, here we have the opening scene, which is the, 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 the Rheingold, uh, rather specifically defined um, as, be, as, as being within uh, uh, what looks like a dam and a power station. Um, here we have um, the, the two giants, I love those giants, uh, and, and, and here we have the 18th century aristocrats who are completely sort of uh, dominated by them. Um, uh, it, 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 here we have uh, the moment in Nibelheim, uh, as we can see uh, that we're really focusing here, the blocking focus upon sort of the idea of the mass of, 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 of people being uh, uh, tremendously oppressed by uh, the, the, the circumstances in which they live and work. Uh, again, this is something that today we actually sort of take as being pretty normal uh, in productions of the ring. Uh, but uh, in, in, in the 1976, this was still sort of, you know, fairly, fairly original. Here we have Friar with the two, I love those two giants. <laughs> like, you can very rarely see giants that big. Um, Seattle managed the giants that big in not their current ring, but in the previous ring. So there were, there were two gigantic giants came on. I really enjoyed them. Um, uh, but but uh, in, in, in a way, in, in true sort of industrial realism, actually the giants are ultimately just reduced to normal-sized human beings. Uh, and here we have the final scene of uh, uh, the um, of, of Das Rheingold as the gods are about to sort of go into Valhalla, which is represented as an industrial sort of workshop. Uh, and the mists, which Wagner talks a lot about in the stage directions, are quite not, quite obviously here, not the mists of the mountain, but the mists of steam and of smoke and of, of things that come out of the sort of the, the, uh, of the workshops of 19th century industrialism. Um, so um, the Charot ring um, uh, did, um, uh, did create a whole sort of offshoot of other productions. Indeed, um, I, I'm going to be seeing the complete um, Zambello ring um, myself next week in San Francisco. Uh, what I have seen of it so far, because I've just seen Rheingold and, and Valkyrie, in many ways it does seem to be an Americanization of Charot. It does seem in many ways to have sort of similar themes uh, uh, to, 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 to Charot. Um, but uh, we, we find that sort of symbolism and romantic realism are still, to a considerable extent, around in the opera house today. Um, let's have a look at one or two symbolist romantic realistic Rheingold's. Here we have the Otto Schenk, uh, which a lot of people talk about as being sort of primarily um, a sort of a return to romantic realism. It wasn't really, I think actually on the whole, I only actually saw the, the, the De Valkyrie in the house, and it struck me actually that it was Appia who was the major influence upon uh, Schneider Simpson in his designs. In fact, I can remember that Act 3 of De Valkyrie almost was a sort of a recreation of Appia's Valkyrie rock. Uh, but here we have the, uh, the Rainbow Bridge um, going across to Valhalla. There, of course, is sort of a, a certain element of realism here. But we can see sort of realism and, uh, and, and, um, uh, and, and symbolism are, are brought together. Um, here we have another picture, uh, which is actually the wrong way round. Um, which, uh, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's difficult to know which is the right way around, because, you know, you get these things off the internet and they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. The later thought of shame. Valhalla was on the left. It was on the left. Okay, so this is this is this this is, this is probably probably it. Um, so um, 
Uh, Seattle, I think, also sort of is very much in this tradition. Uh, this is the Stephen Wadsworth production, which was uh, 2001, and of course is still regularly being performed today. 